Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Advancing Adventism. Now, in this video, we're going to be doing something very specific. We're going to be looking at some statements from Ellen White and comparing them to statements found in Second Estrus. Now, Second Estrus, as you may or may not know, is a book that is found in the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is essentially um, books that are accepted by most non-Protestant Christians as part of the Old Testament and typically not accepted by most Protestants as part of the Old Testament. Now, that's just a super simplistic explanation of the Apocrypha. But the main focus of this video isn't on trying to explain what the Apocrypha is. We may have other content that will um, make sure to cover those aspects in more detail. But right now, we are just wanting to compare some statements from Ellen White to statements found in Second Estrus. Now, in a previous video, um, why SDAs should care about the Apocrypha, we looked at several statements from different SDA pioneers, uh, and we, we saw how very clearly early SDAs cared about the Apocrypha. And uh, I'll be sure to have a link to this video in the description, but don't worry, you don't have to have watched it in order to follow what we're going to be doing in this video. Um, but I will have a link there because I hope that you will watch it. I think that understanding, you know, that there's reasons to care about the Apocrypha is very important for SDAs. And as we continue over time on this channel to share more about the Apocrypha and the connection to Seventh-day Adventism, or especially early Seventh-day Adventism and the Apocrypha, you know, over time, it'll become more and more apparent why it's significant to care about the Apocrypha. But for now, Again, we're just going to be sticking with comparing some statements from Ellen White. So even though you don't need to have watched the first video, I, there is a couple little things from that other video that I'd like to share as a segue into what we're about to cover. This is one of the slides from the very ending of the other video. It's a vision that Ellen White had in 1849. And in particular, if you'll notice, these are remarks that she made while in vision. Uh, take note of the parts in yellow in particular. The Bible that she had during her vision while she did various things, you know, she's described um, as walking around with the Bible, placing it on people, gesturing with it, and that sort of thing. That Bible contained the Apocrypha. And again, it really should come as no surprise that it contained the Apocrypha because it was a pretty standard thing in the early, early mid-1800s for uh, Bibles to have the Apocrypha included in the Old Testament as just part of the Bible. It wasn't until 1820s that the Apocrypha started to more commonly be left out of Bibles. And again, I'm not going to go into all those details, but that might be an important thing to take note of that really back in that day, it was commonplace for Bibles to contain the Apocrypha. Okay, now, uh, in addition to this account we covered a little bit in the previous video, there's another account. And this is just from a few months later, and this is Ellen White recording what she was shown in vision. And notice that she said that she was shown in vision that the Apocrypha was the hidden book. This is in the yellow highlight there if you want to follow along. She says, I saw the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. Okay, now again, this is significant because. This isn't just something that Ellen White made up in her imagination. I mean, if, if we're SDAs and we believe that Ellen White was an inspired messenger of God and that her visions were from God, then we should be freely willing to recognize that God is the one who showed her these things and that for her to say she saw that the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it, that that's something God revealed to her. So I think that's pretty important. And as we continue, we will see more and more. Now, as I said, 
the statements from Ellen White that we're going to be looking at are, um, we're going to compare them with statements from Second Estrus. Now you saw the three-headed eagle drop in there. That is a depiction of an eagle that was shown to Estrus while in vision. So if you see that um, on the cover of a book for Second Estrus, you'll know that that's found in one of his visions. You can find that described in chapters 11 and 12. Now, it's important to mention that what I'm going to be sharing, they're not quotations from Second Estrus, okay? Now, some of the wording is very close to the wording in Second Estrus, but we're going to be looking primarily at allusions to things found in Second Estrus. And I'll explain what I mean by this. This is actually something that you'll probably very easily relate to um, by using the book of Revelation as an example. So in the Revelation chapter 13, there is this beast that's described and it's, it's kind of like a leopard, but then it kind of has some body parts of a lion and some body parts of a bear. And while these are um, all describing like this one beast, it's almost like a composite of these different types of beasts. Very clearly, it's alluding back to different beasts that Daniel was shown in vision. You can find this in Daniel chapter 7. And even though for Daniel, he was shown a leopard and a lion and a bear, not one beast that has body parts of all of those animals, there's differences between what Daniel saw and what we see depicted in Revelation 13, but very clearly Revelation is alluding back to Daniel. So that's what I mean by an allusion. It's very closely connected. You can tell that there's a relationship there, but it's just not a direct quotation. Okay. So that is what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to start by looking at the part highlighted in yellow, and we're going to compare that with something from Second Estrus. Okay, so here's what Ellen White said in Manuscript for 1850. She says, I saw that the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. And notice in 2nd Estrus chapter 12, verses 37 and 38, the angel is speaking to Estrus and tells Estrus, therefore write all these things that thou hast seen in a book and hide them. So there's the hidden book, okay? and teach them to the wise of the people whose hearts thou knowest may comprehend and keep these secrets. So very clearly, we've got the hidden book, the Apocrypha. We've got the wise in both passages, and these wise are supposed to understand or comprehend what's contained in the hidden books. Now, that's a really obvious allusion to Second Estrus, and uh, I think we would all agree with that. Okay, so with all that said, we're going to be looking primarily at a document called A Word to the Little Flock. And uh, there are several allusions found in this document from Ellen White's visions, uh, allusions to Second Estrus. Now, I will have a link to a word to the little flock in the description so that you can read the whole document if you want to. It's very, it's in a very important historical document and um, I recommend that you become familiar with it if you aren't already. Now on page 13 of a word to the little flock, James White mentions, if you notice in the yellow, he says the following vision was published in the day star more than a year ago. By the request of friends, it is republished in this little work with scripture references for the benefit of the little flock. Now, I'm including that because I just want to point out that James White here is saying these visions or this vision is being um, reprinted with scripture references. Now, there's no distinction made in his statement about some scripture and some not scripture, like some apocryphal stuff. No, it's just scripture references. No distinction made. And then further on, 
uh, in the document, you'll find footnoted uh, on, from page to page various scripture references and intermixed with books like Ezekiel, uh, Revelation, Habakkuk, whatever, you find some apocryphal books. And it's primarily Second Estrus, but the Wisdom of Solomon is also cited in A Word to the Little Flock. But we're not going to cover a wis the, the Wisdom of Solomon at all in this video. We're just focused on Second Estrus. Okay. Now, on this page, this is page 19 from A Word to the Little Flock. I just want to point out uh, several of the highlights there, these are various footnotes in one of Ellen White's visions, and these are just the apocryphal footnotes, okay? And some of them are pretty long, so I decided I'm not going to try to read through the second estrus portion of these or anything like that. I just want to point you, again, there will be a link in the description. And for these longer ones, like verses 68 to 74, you know, and there's several verses there. Um, it's kind of impractical to do in a shorter video. So you'll be able to go and read those. I will also have a link to second estrus. So we're just going to focus in this video on the shorter statements, but the rest of the, um, the references are there for you to go and check out personally. Okay, so now let's consider some of the allusions to Second Estrus. Now here's one. Uh, this is alluding to Second Estrus chapter two, verse 19. Ellen White writes, and about it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies. And notice in Second Estrus, it says, and seven mighty mountains whereupon there grow roses and lilies. I think that uh, allusion is pretty obvious and it's very direct. And again, we're just skimming through some of these allusions. And then, you know, the intention is, hey, go and check out the fuller articles, uh, the full pamphlet, A Word to the Little Flock read second estrus and do some good personal study there as well. Okay, next one. Ellen White says the streams ceased to flow. And in second estrus 624, we find that there are springs of the fountains that shall stand still. And in three hours, they shall not run. So we have an allusion to streams ceasing to flow or uh, streams standing still, right? They're not running anymore. Here's another one found in 2nd Estrus 15, verses 34 and 35. Ellen White writes, dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. And James White footnotes to these. And if it wasn't clear, these are footnotes that James White included in A Word to the Little Flock. Okay, so he footnotes to 2nd Estrus 15, verses 34 and 35, which reads, Behold, clouds from the east and from the north unto the south, and they are very horrible to look upon, full of wrath and storm. So that dark, heavy clouds, you know, wrath and storm, they shall smite one upon another. So they clashed against each other, right? Pretty clear allusion there to 2nd Estrus. All right, now here's another one that James cites. Uh, Ellen White writes, Jesus brought along the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads. And in Second Estrus it reads, and in the midst of them, there was a young man of a high stature, taller than all the rest. And upon every one of their heads, he set crowns, etc." Okay, so, Again, you can see I've color coded and underlined to show the direct connections, the direct allusion there by Ellen White to Second Estrus. Okay, this one's a really interesting one because James White includes a footnote, but he doesn't footnote to Second Estrus. But I'll, I'll explain why I'm including it. He footnotes instead to Isaiah, Isaiah 26, verse 2 to be exact. And if you'll notice, uh, there's some pretty obvious parallels between these two passages, what Ellen White wrote and what we find in Isaiah. They both mention the gates being opened. 
They both mention, um, well, Isaiah mentions a righteous nation and Ellen White mentions um, that Jesus says to the people, you have washed your robes in my blood. So there's, you know, a connection there. Washing your robes in Jesus' blood would equate to righteousness, right? And then um, Jesus says, you've stood stiffly for my truth, enter in in what Ella White writes. And then in Isaiah, it says, uh, the righteous nation, which keepeth the truth may enter in. Okay. So you find these three main ideas in both passages. So, I mean, James White had good reason for footnoting to Isaiah, but something else that's really interesting. You might've noticed the phrase, um, washed your robes in my blood. And maybe you were thinking, wow, that really sounds more like Revelation, right? And I think you'd probably be right. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14 in particular, it says, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I mean, that's very directly an allusion to Revelation 7, 14. So James White could have very easily included Revelation 7, 14 in the footnote, but he didn't, but, but he could have, right? And if he had, we would all be like, well, obviously that's warranted. You know, it's a clear allusion to that. Well, this uh, isn't the only spot, this wash your robes in my blood. This isn't the only spot where we can find a more direct allusion uh, to something in another book other than Isaiah. Okay. In second Estrus chapter two, verse 47, we read, so he answered and said unto me, so this is the angel talking to Estrus, right? We saw this part of it anyway, just a little bit earlier. He said unto me, it is the son of God whom they have confessed in the world. Then began I greatly to commend them that stood so stiffly for the name of the Lord. Okay, now very clearly we can see the connection there between stood stiffly for my truth and stood so stiffly for the name of the Lord. Now the wording is a little bit different, but we can certainly see the allusion. Now there is um, every reason to think that early. SDAs would have recognized this uh, phrase, stood stiffly for my truth, and thought of second estrus. Here's one such statement from a woman named Sister Harp. And she says, uh, there are eight, uh, down at the bottom there, she says, there are eight of us in number here. Four of us have had experience in the Advent movement. So that's pre-SDA, the, you know, Millerites and all that. In the Advent movement, and we mean to be of that company that Estrus saw who stood stiffly for the truth. Now, the interesting thing about that statement is that in second Estrus, the wording isn't, it doesn't directly match this. It doesn't directly say stood stiffly for the truth. It says stood so stiffly for the name of the Lord. It's Alan White who used the phrase, stood stiffly for my truth. And yet there was Sister Harp saying that uh, it's reminding her of Second Estrus who said, or we mean to be of that company that Second Estrus saw who stood so stiffly for the truth. There's that statement again, so you can see it for yourself. Okay, so... Clearly, even though Ellen said truth instead of the Lord, early SDAs recognized this wording as being found in Second Estrus. Now, there are some more statements also that we will just quickly look at. Just You'll be able to find these if you want to look at them more closely, but we're just going to kind of breeze through a few more statements. Here's another one, Brother A.A. A. Marks. You can see here he's using the phrase stood stiffly for the truth. Brother Sanborn uses the phrase stand stiffly for the truth. Sister H.M. Grant includes the phrase stand stiffly for the truth. 
M.E. Cornell, one of the early SDA ministers, he uses the phrase stand stiffly for the whole truth. And we have several times where Ellen White uses this phrase outside of um, what we've read from A Word to the Little Flock. So here are a few examples of her repeatedly using this phrase over the years throughout her lifetime. In Experience and Views, the supplement in uh, 1854, the supplement to her 1851 book, early experience and views of Mrs. Ellen G. White. And I might have got the title a little bit wrong. But anyway, I'll, I'll have a link to that in the description. Uh, and then here we have another one. In a letter that she wrote, she says, Dear brother, do not yield one particle of the truth. Stand stiffly for the truth, etc., etc. And then here we have her again in another letter saying, while we stand stiffly for the truth, we are to be sure to exercise the meekness of Christ. And here again in the Review and Herald, 1897, she's using the phrase, stand stiffly for the truth. And then we'll just look at one more. This is 1903 where she says he is to stand stiffly for the truth for this time. Okay, so very clearly there are strong allusions in Ellen White's writings to things that we find in Second Estrus. And I just want to leave you with this statement that she reports from her vision where God showed her that the Apocrypha is the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. Now, this is too important to overlook like there's something going on here right i think it's very obvious there's something going on and so let's um let's start digging for this hidden treasure in these hidden books you never know what we might find and um for those who might be interested in apocrypha within early seventh-day adventism there's a scholar by the name of matthew courtman who um has a lot of of information to share in this regard. And so I will provide links to uh, where you can read some of his material. I'll, I'll provide links in the description. Okay, well, with that said, I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you were blessed by the content. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And um, that way you can click the bell and receive notifications of our new uploads. And uh, feel free to share the content. And we look forward to seeing you back next time. Many blessings.